own laws, really. They're like private legislatures, and they create through the contract whatever provisions are going to um, govern their own behavior. And so the will theory of contracting is that it's individually empowering to allow people to do this without interference from the government. There's also an economic justification for freedom of contract, which is that um, future expectations that people create individually have present value interest. And therefore, the judicial protection of those interests is important to give the contracts monetary value. Basically, when you enforce private agreements, it increases societal wealth. So it's a wealth building mechanism. So economics, wealth building, and liberty both justify a freedom of contract approach to contracts. Um, the one thing that courts really do not ever speak of is a question of morality. Should people just keep their agreements because it's the right thing to do, and maybe it's not a very nice thing to tell someone you will do something and then decide not to do it? Um, that's really not the question. And so the court never asks, did you want to keep your contract, or did you try to keep your obligation? They only ask, did you do it or not? We don't care why. It's strict liability. If you don't keep your contract obligations, you must pay, even if you had a good reason. But it's not a culpable thing. It's not seen as a bad thing to, um, to breach your contract. And because of that, the court really doesn't want the contract damages to be a punishment. It's not like a crime. You, pay, you break a contract, it's just you have to pay the other side the cost that they incur from your breach. You don't actually want it to be a penalty. The whole per point of a contract damages is to compensate the party that doesn't breach just up to the point where they would have been compensated had the contract gone through. So this is basic US contract damages. Generally, the remedy is compens compensatory monetary damages. Almost never in US law are contracts specifically enforced. And what I mean by that is the court does not force people to perform. They merely figure out the cost to the non-breaching party of the breaching party's non-performance and then make the breaching party pay that money. So really, anyone can get out of a contract for a price, and the price is contract damages. Um, the, so parties are free, really, not just to enter into contracts, but to, to breach contracts. And these economic damages preserves freedom and efficiency, and actually a lot of scholars in the US have argued that our legal system should not only refrain from penalizing contract breach, as wrongful, but they actually, our system should encourage contract breach when it makes economic sense. So it, it's better for me to walk away from my obligation and pay this money than the law should encourage me to do that. Um, that's actually a debated issue in US law, but it is something a lot of scholars have written. And so because of all these economic concerns, there is a real hesitancy on the part of the court to enforce a provision if it looks like that provision is actually going to specifically be there to discourage breach. Because breach can, is okay. So if you have something that is the only reason that provision in the contract is to, to has an interorum effect to keep you from breaching, then that will be policed. And it's not policed by the legislature, it's policed by the court, by the judges who individually will look at it. Um, so the basic contract damages, if you do not have a provision in the contract, if there's nothing about damages, this is how they would figure it out. The main concept is to figure out the financial equivalent to where the non-breaching party would have been. Um, and then once uh, you figure that, that's called the expectation damages. And then you figure the difference between where you actually are and where you expect it to be, and that difference is what the breaching party has to pay. Just to make this clear, because it's kind of hard in, um, in the abstract, I have on the very back of your handout a few little examples for how it would work. So if you want to pull it out, I'm just going to walk through them so you can see how this would be calculated if there's nothing in the contract. And I'm starting with uh, damages without agreed damages just because that is the benchmark of what's fair, and then we can turn to the agreed damages to see how they're different. So say you had a contract for the sale of real estate, since I talked about that first. And here you have a sale of real estate from the seller to the buyer for $100,000. After entering into the contract, the market value of the real property falls to $95,000, and the buyer repudiates the deal. He says, I won't perform, breaching the contract. And at this point, let's assume the buyer has not paid anything. The court would calculate the lost benefit of the bargain this way. They would say the contract price is $100,000, 
the, uh, the non-breaching party thought that they would get $100,000. Now they don't get $100,000, but they have property that's worth $95,000, and so their damages would be $100,000 minus $95,000, $5,000. Um, it turns out, even if the non-breaching party doesn't sell the property for $95,000, maybe it takes a long time to find another buyer, and they sell for $90,000, then they just have only $5,000 recovered, and they end up $5,000 lower. But that's the way we measure it. The second example is an employment contract. One year employment contract for $60,000 salary. After six months of work, $30,000 salary is paid, but then the employer fires the employee, breaching the contract. So what is the employee's benefit of the bargain? And you might think maybe it is $30,000, but actually it's not, because you have to figure out, could this other employee, could he find another job? So maybe he could find another job in two months, and it would pay the same amount, so he would get $20,000 during the last six months of that term, and he would only be able to recover $10,000 of the promised salary. The third example is a construction contract to build a home for $200,000. Before starting the project, prior to any payment, the construction contractor repudiates the deal, breaches the contract, it's going to cost, oh, it says two twenty, dollars but it should be $220,000 <laughs> to hire someone else to do the job. What's the benefit of the bargain that's lost? Easily, that's just the $20,000 additional amount that you have to pay. So if you could fire, find somebody else to build the house for the exact same amount, there'd be zero damages. Um, so that's the benefit of the bargain in financial terms. The amount it would cost the non-breaching party to pay to get to the same place from a different source. And you can see that through this, there's this doctrine of avoidable consequences, that you cannot recover losses that you could avoid by acting reasonably, by looking for another buyer or someone else to build your house. Um, in some cases, and Number D is an example of this. You can get the entire amount that you thought you would get under a contract, but that really only works if you have unlimited things to sell or a very large inventory. So say you're a seller and you have 1,000 washing machines and you contract to sell 200, then that buyer doesn't buy them. Then you sell 200 the next day. That buyer might claim, oh, you have no damages because you just sold them to somebody else. But really, if no one had breached, you could have sold 200 here and 200 here, so you've lost the full amount of the contract, and in that case, you can get the entire um, contract price, the uh, $200,000, 200, yeah, 200,000 back. So that's what you would get there. Um, you can also, in addition to this, get other losses if they arise from the breach. So if you hire a sales agent to list the house, when the buyer backs out, you may recover that cost. You can recover the cost of storing and transporting materials until you resell them, the cost of advertising for a replacement employee, the cost of, from a breach of warranty that comes from the bad quality of good. However, all of these losses are limited. And this is an important thing for understanding uh, why people even enter into um, stipulated damages. First of all, as I mentioned, you cannot recover losses that could have reasonably been avoided. Also, importantly, you cannot recover any losses that were not foreseeable to the breaching party at the time of the contract. So, if I, this is example E, if I hire somebody to provide me with some materials I need to perform another contract, and then I tell the material supplier, look, I must have these materials at this date or I will be in a breach of another contract, then I could recover my costs under the other contract if he breaches. But if I don't inform my material provider that I need those materials for another contract, I can never recover that. So if I had a huge, huge contract that would fall apart if I didn't get this one piece, I have to make sure I tell my supplier or they will de their default will never let me recover the loss over here because it's too not foreseeable. Another limitation is you cannot recover any lost benefits that were speculative at the time. So if you have a venture that's not certain and you think you're going to make profits, but you can't prove you're going to make profits, then the breach of the other party will not let you get those profits. I have an example here, a woman hired to appear in a play on Broadway, and she hopes that when she appears in this play, she will then become a famous actress and then she's fired before she appears. She cannot, she maybe can recover some salary, but she can't recover her lost start of career um, 
because that wasn't a certain thing. And there's some very funny, actually, cases about this. There was that man who was, who was contracted to appear nude on the front of a, a pornographic publication for women, and then they didn't put him on the front, and he sued and said he would have been a famous porn star if they'd only put him on the front of this magazine. And the court said, no, we don't know. He would have been a famous porn star. It's kind of funny to show up in court and argue that you would have been a famous porn star but for this breach. Um, so those are some things you can't recover. Other things that you can't recover are things like your mental uh, anguish or your emotional harm if you're very upset because someone breached their contract, you can't recover for that. You can't recover for any amounts you spend bringing the breach of contract action. And this is important because in many, many jurisdictions, the person who breaches, if they lose their case, they have to pay the other parties attorney fees. But in the United States, you don't. It's a pay-to-play jurisdiction. If you want to bring a contract action, you have to pay your own attorney's fees. <clears throat> and so because of that, the most you could ever recover is the amount, the lost benefit of the bargain. But you will never recover attorney's fees. So you are always worse off if there's a breach than if there's not, and you're the non-breaching party. So it, you could argue this is kind of unfair. Um, there's some dissatisfaction with this rule, in fact. Um, and it's quite common for contracts to have changes to the common law rule in their contract. And one of the first things they do, actually, well, they, I'll put these all up here, um, they say that it's very hard to not have attorney fees. So you very often have a provision in the contract that says you will pay for attorney fees. That's usually enforced unless it says only one party would pay. If, if Katie and I have a contract and it says if I breach, I will pay, but if she breach, Breaches, I still have to pay. Well, that's not going to be enforced. But if it goes both ways, then it will always be enforced. Um, you can see why people want to have agreed upon damages. If you think about how damages are calculated in the absence of an agreement, uh, you it's have some difficulty in figuring out exactly what your benefit is, especially if it's something that's hard to value, like real estate. Um, you also could have prov provisions for paying things like attorney fees or other costs. Sometimes if there's damages that aren't foreseeable, like a lot of collateral damages, you might want to have a provision in your contract for that. And often if you have a speculative venture, you want to make sure you're covering those speculative losses because without a provision in your contract, there's no way you can cover it at all. And so that's a very useful reason to have it. But there is um, some other reasons why. And anyway, you can see that maybe the solution is agreed upon damages. If you have a liquidated damages provision, it's much, much easier to calculate damages. You can go, uh, usually the part of a lawsuit that involves calculating the damages is at least half of the whole lawsuit. So the fees will be less and the time for your attorney will be less. And it also makes it more certain how much you will get. And because it's more certain how much you'll have to pay, then if you're the breaching party, you can make that decision. You know exactly how much to pay to get out of a contract. Um, it also makes a fairer recovery, arguably, at least particularly with um, attorney fees, and it also provides a means to recover speculative losses. But there is another reason that people enter into stipulated damages provisions, and that's to discourage and punish the breach. Because remember, the courts do not discourage or punish the breach. They only make the non-breaching party economically whole. Um, the problem is, if you enter into a stipulated damage provision and the intent, the reason is to punish the breach, the courts will strike it down as a penalty. And so let me talk about how this works. Courts almost always enforce terms in contracts. They almost always do. And they almost never look at any terms to figure out if they're fair. Um, unless the contract's invalid because it was procured by fraud or duress or somebody was insane or if there's a statute that says you cannot have this kind of contract or it's clearly against public policy or you have an unfair process plus unfair terms. But it's the real focus is on the process of entering into the contract. Once you have a contract, the courts don't figure out if it's a good contract or a bad contract. I tell my contract students, the law won't protect you from yourself. You make a bad contract, oh well, your problem, not the court's problem. Um, if the parties agree after a breach to a settlement of a claim, the courts do not figure out if the settlement is fair. They just say, has the settlement been fairly entered into? And courts actually push people to settle. I worked for a judge who brought the parties into the chambers and said, you need to settle this deal. I'm going to go outside, take an hour, and work it out. 
So they push people to settle their disputes. Um, and so you'd think that maybe the courts would also really encourage and support uh, stipulated damage provision, but in a, a unique way, in the only way, in the only part of a contract really that courts will take an approach to um, here are, they take a kind of a hostile approach to liquidated damages. And in a way, in the freedom of contact, contract mindset of the American law, that seems a little odd because you always enforce settlement agreements, you enforce all kinds of other terms that are unfair, why not enforce liquidated damages? And I think it goes back to the fact that there really are two policies underlying freedom of contract, not just liberty, but also economics. And they worry about the economic impact of enforcing something that's a penalty because it limits the freedom to breach a contract. Um, and so under that economic justification, you do have courts worrying, looking more closely at agreed to damages. I think they're also worried about um, bargaining disparity in that situation too. So that's why I think you have it. And because of that, we have a rule that liquidated damages will be enforced only if reasonable. This means three things. They have to meet three different thresholds to be enforced. First, the um, agreed to damages. Well, first, the parties have to have intended to have this be an estimate. If it's clear that the parties intended it as a penalty, it will be struck down based on that intention because, again, we don't punish breach. Second, it has to be the kind of contract that where it's difficult to determine the amount of damages, which is sort of interesting because then you have to argue that, well, we, this is maybe something speculative or, or real estate or something. It's hard to figure out exactly how much something's worth. It's not automatically available to have stipulated damages if it's something where damage calculation would be very straightforward. And third, the liquidated damage amount has to be a reasonable forecast of compensation. So in a way, this is very bizarre. You have to argue, this is a kind of contract that no one can figure out what the damages are. And then you also have to argue, and I figured it out. <laughs> so that it's reasonable somehow I figured out what it is. Um, the concept is, if the actual damages are easy to calculate, we are not going to enforce your, your stipulated damages. And even if they're not easy to calculate, you have to prove that they're a reasonable estimate. Now the one thing to remember also is the party who is arguing that the damage provision is a penalty has the burden of proof with respect to it being a penalty. And that means that they have to prove to the court that it is more likely than not that one of these things is not true. That either the parties intended it to be a penalty, or that this is a kind of contract where damage calculation is easy, or that it's not a reasonable estimate. Um, if the clause is enforceable, of course, it's binding on both parties. So the breaching party doesn't have to pay more, but the non-breaching party can't collect more either. So you can't sue for this plus other damages too, even if it's too low. So let's talk about what this prong test, to determine whether what parties intended, typically courts look at the language of the provision. I tell my contract students who are drafting contracts not to use the, the F word or the P word. Now in American, those are both, you could say F word or P word for, um, for bad words in American slang. But what we really mean for the F word here is forfeiture and the P word for penalty. Um, because those are both words that will tell courts, oh, this looks like a punishment, this doesn't look like an estimate. But a lot of times, if you're at all savvy, you will not draft your contract to say, this is a penalty, because then you're just inviting the court to strike it out. So most of the time, it will be drafted the other way. We're agreeing to these damages, and we're hereby agreeing this is not a penalty. Okay, that's what they say, but let's see if that's good enough. Because you also have to show that it's the kind of contract that would be hard to determine actual damages. And what we really mean there is something like speculative profits, like example F from my examples, um, where you just don't know if it's going to work out or not. You would never be able to collect those damages under actual expectation damages, and the only way you could collect it is if you had it in the contract. Um, also, if there's a lot of consequential damages, like other people getting hurt from this breach, then that's the kind of thing you could have a justification to have it stipulated damages also, if the subject matter of the contract is unique and it's hard to value, like real estate or services and employment, um, or it could be that you need to give the entire amount back and you don't want to argue that you have to avoid consequences by reselling. So those types of contexts are typically sufficient. The harder difficult part is this reasonable forecast of harm. 
And there's a split among US jurisdictions. There's two different ways to approach this. Um, remember, you're already in a context where you're saying even calculating is very difficult, and now you have to prove that somehow you made a reasonable calculation um, ex ante before the contract is even entered into. It's difficult to anticipate damages, but what we've come out with is a reasonable measurement of it and not a disguised penalty. The real question here is when was that a reasonable estimate? Was it at the time you contracted or was it at the time of the breach? Um, under US common law, the law of cases has been summarized in a restatement, which is not actually a statute, it's just a summary of legal holdings. And the restatement actually says what the statute that deals with sales of goods, that's universal, um, the Uniform Commercial Code 2718 says the same thing. The language is here says damages for breach by either party may be liquidated in the contract, but the provision will not be enforced and will be void as a penalty unless the amount it fixes as damages is reasonable in light of anticipated or actual harm caused by the breach. This is not a very helpful statute actually because if you look at it, they have to be reasonable in light of anticipated or actual harm. And they use the word or. So some courts say, well, that means that if you can find reasonableness either place, it's okay. So if you look at the beginning of the day when you're contracting and they could have reasonably anticipated this would be the amount of damages, that is sufficient to meet this test. But other courts say, mm, we don't really think or really means or. We think or means and. And therefore, if you get to the breach, and it turns out that there's a big difference between the actual damages and the amount of the liquidated damages, then it looks like a penalty. So is it just prospective? Is it just looking from the front on? Or can you do hindsight? We have a saying in the US called hindsight is 2020, that when you look back, you always see what you should have done differently. So can they second guess and look back and take, um, take things out as penalties for that reason. So um, the perspective approach basically has a snapshot in time at the time of contracting. And this is the traditional approach under US law. At, at the time they entered into the contract, the parties had a good faith reason to anticipate damages would be approximately that liquidated amount, then we're going to enforce it. I'd say about 60% of US courts take this approach. But the more modern approach is this second look that you also look back after the breach, and you calculate what the actual damages would be, and then you figure out, is there too big of a difference between actual damages, the way that we talked about how you calculate them, and the liquidated damages? And if the difference is too big, then it's a penalty. Um, it's modern, but it's problematic because it arose the reason you have the liquidated damages clause. Not only does it say you can't recover for things that you wanted to contract to recover for, but now you have to go through all of the trouble of proving what damages are. And that's half the lawsuit, which you tried to avoid, and now you can't avoid, because they have to determine that. Um, the other thing is it does seem to unfairly penalize a bad guess. You make a guess, turns out it was wrong, all of a sudden your clause is invalid as a penalty. So there is a split among the jurisdictions with respect to that. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of cases as some examples. This is a case that rejects the modern approach. It's from Kansas just last year, 2012, and they were determining whether liquidated damage provision can be based on a prospective view if there are no damages at all. Um, and in this case, they held that proof of actual harm is not a condition precedent to recovering liquidated damages. Here you had a company Walka Metroplex, which we'll call Walco, and they entered into a contract with Westar to provide them with equipment that Westar was using in a construction contract. Because they needed this equipment for their other contract, they had a provision in the contract that said, for every day your delivery is late, you have to pay so many dollars. And then they delivered two months late. But it turned out that Westar actually didn't start his other project until, they didn't start it until much later. And so there were no damages at all. But Westar said, well, we still are going to um, collect all of these damages. We will deduct from the amount we owe you for the equipment that number of dollars per day. And so Walco sued and said, you can't deduct money because you had no harm at all. Um, he said it was too big of a penalty. And the court here applying Kansas law found that where contract language is clear, 
and the liquidated damages you prospectively could possibly be a reasonable estimate that they were going to uphold the clause. And so they argued that um, it was not a penalty and that worked. And they said, you know, they, they had to determine the difference between an enforceable clause, which requires some certain or a penalty. And they said, as long as we don't find an interim effect, then we're going to uphold the clause. Interim effect meaning that, that it's a scary thing. It sort of puts a barrier up for breach. And they say that really didn't happen here. And so the clause was permissible. And they gave a lot of deference to the language. Um, this is a really high threshold to meet, actually. You have to do that. You have to both say that it's not dependent on anything that happens. It doesn't turn on whether it, it only turns on whether it was reasonable when they first entered into the contract. And even if there's no harm at all, it's still valid. So it's very hard in these jurisdictions to ever strike down a clause as a penalty. Because you, even when there's zero harm, they still uphold the clause. Some other cases showing how this works. There's this Berry School v. Patch case. This was from 2007 in Maryland. The Patches enrolled their daughter in a public school, and then they paid the tuition, and then they decided before the school started that they did not want their daughter to go to school, and they asked for the money back. But the contract with the school said, no, we can keep all of your tuition for the whole year if you, uh, if you breach. And in fact, the tuition is quite a lot. I can put this like $15,000 for tuition. And so then they said, that's not fair. We should get it back. Um, and they uh, said, after all, you had a waiting list of people who wanted to go to the school. And when we canceled, you just took someone from the waiting list. So now you made an entire extra tuition. You didn't have any harm at all. Um, the court thought about this rule and they said, well, the provision doesn't say it's a penalty. This is the kind of situation where it would be hard to calculate a con uh, damages. It's hard to predict when another student could be found to add to the class. Uh, they don't want people to join in the middle of the year, they had to buy books, they had to hire teachers, and so it was the type of contract where actual damages might be difficult, and then they said, um, it looks like it was probably a reasonable estimate at the time they contracted. Although I think that's a little bit strange, because if they had a waiting list at the time they contracted, it probably wasn't reasonable to think that they would have full tuition damages, maybe a month tuition damages. But they did, they did allow the contract. If they had applied a retrospective look, though, if they had done the look back, then they would never have enforced this provision because there were zero damages. And they would say, paying $15,000 for damages when your actual damages are zero seems like a penalty to us. Um, and actually, the trial court found a penalty, but the appellate court reversed and said there's no penalty here because uh, this is. The, the appellate court says you do not deduct avoidable damages. Once liquidated damage is valid, it is a recovery. You can't take out the mitigation clause. Um, that was another argument here is that you, it, it's bad policy if you allow people to collect the damages and not avoid consequences. But they said, well, if you have a liquidated damages clause, we're not going to worry about mitigated damages. In fact, all of the damage calculation just gets put to the side and you just follow whatever the clause said. Um, and even the complete absence of harm doesn't justify reduction of liability. Now, one fun thing about U.S. courts, and I don't know if they do this in Georgia, um, is that a lot of times courts disagree, even internally, and here there were three judges and one judge disagreed with the other two. And so he wrote a very long and angry dissent in this case, and he said, under U.S. law, you always have recovery capped and compensation. And here's overcompensation, and so that's not fair, and it's also not efficient. So it's bad in every possible way. And plus, if you don't require mitigation, that's bad policy. It leads to wasteful losses. It leads to overcompensation. Why should these people be out $15,000 and the school get $15,000 more than what they thought they were going to get? It just doesn't, there's no justification for that. Um, on the one hand, the dissent's hard to justify because of freedom of contract. The whole point of liquidated damages is to avoid having to calculate damages. Well, then we should avoid calculating damages and, and go ahead and apply the contract. Um, and you already have a safety net here because you have to show it's reasonable. And so freedom of contract pushes that way. But on the other hand, economics pushes the other way because maybe it should uh, be that we don't allow double recovery. Okay, so then there's another case I wanted to mention. This is a West Haven Associates 
the um, cost cutters of Madison. And here there's a 10 year lease for space in a mall by cost cutters, and the lease was required continual operation. They said, if you don't operate every day that you're dark, you have to pay $20 extra. They went out of operation and they paid their rent, but then they did not pay the 20 days in addition. And they argued they should not because it was an unenforceable penalty. Um, they said it was double recovery. But actually it was really two types of stipulated damages, the rent damages and the being dark damages. And the court said that there are lots of reasons that you might have a hard time calculating actual damages in the case of a tenant in a shopping center. Because if one tenant goes out of business, less customers are coming to the center. And so all the other stores are hurt by that. And so that's a reason why you could have um, just a collateral effect, which justifies having a stipulated damage clause. And here the, reasonable seemed, uh, the estimates seem reasonable when viewed prospectively. A couple other contexts. Construction cases. You see liquidated damages in almost every construction contract. Um, they're very, very common because you want to make sure that things happen on schedule, and so they give damages for delay. Um, because they're so common, they're almost always found reasonable, especially if there's an upper cap, and they say you pay this much per day, but not more than uh, some total amount. And you don't actually need to show that those amounts of money were actually incurred at all. But there are two cases here, just to show you an example, you still can't have it be a penalty. The Hunton construction case, they had a 500 a day delay damages for constructing this new uh, fiber optic line. And they said that's reasonable. They didn't have to really prove that they lost $500 a day. They just said, well, you didn't want to have a delay. You couldn't, it's hard to tell exactly how much that would cost you, so it's reasonable. But there is another case um, in a different court where they had a $400 a day delay for damages by not constructing, and they said, no, that's an unenforceable penalty. You can't have that, and they struck it down. And you can see it's even lower per day. So it could be just the difference of the courts. Um, employment cases are another context where you see a lot of stipulated damages, um, and they're very difficult in terms of actually calculating damages, and so courts usually say it's the right context to have stipulated damages, but they do want to make sure they're not penalties to employment cases to compare. Here's one, Vanderbilt v. Nidardo. They had a provision saying it was for a coach of a football team. And they said, you are on a five-year contract, and if you leave before the five year, you have to pay one entire year of salary. And so he did leave, and they said he had to pay, and the court said that was reasonable because it's very hard for the team if the coach leaves and it's you know, disruptive. But then there was another provision that said the insurance agent has to pay, pay back their sales commissions if they leave and then go compete against another against their old company. And the court said, no, that's a penalty. Um, and I think that might be because they don't like to enforce provisions not to compete. But it's interesting that in one case they had to pay back the salary and the other one they didn't. Um, in cases where you have liquidated damages by the employer to the employee, courts are very willing to enforce them, actually. Here you have an employee with a three-year contract, and he was fired two, two, year, two months into the contract, and the court said, well, this damage provision said you had to pay the whole amount, so you have to pay the whole amount, and it's reasonable even though he got another job you know, the next month for the rest of two and a half years because a lot of emotional harm from being fired and maybe your reputation is damaged, and so the court, I think, tried very hard to enforce that provision because it was more inclined to make the company pay than the individual pay. If it had been the other way around, and that he had to pay like the entire amount they were paying him back, I don't think they would have enforced it. And then you know we saw that it was on case. So finally, I have a little practice for us to look at all this and see how it would work. And it's right inside the last page: a liquidated damage and hypothetical. Oh, that's very small. I don't know if you can read it, but um, they have it here too. And I just thought we would look at one provision and see if we can think of what a court would do. Here I have Debbie agreeing to buy a home from Ed. $250,000, she deposits $10,000, signs a contract, and the contract has this clause, and I'll read it to you. The parties hereto agree that actual damages from a breach will be difficult to calculate, and hereby agree that the contract deposit amount shall serve as the agreed to damages in the event of buyer's default, and in such event shall be forfeited to seller. Well, then the housing values drop, and Debbie decides she does not want to go with the deal, and tells Ed she's backing out. She wants her deposit back. Will the court enforce the liquidated damages provision? Well, 
I think the one problem with this is it uses the, the F word, forfeiture, forfeited, and so a court might say, ooh, by using that word, you create a presumption that this is a penalty. But that's just a presumption. You could rebut that presumption and say, well, actually, they just used that word. They shouldn't have used it. They just meant that uh, that was a mechanism to, to pay estimate rather than a forfeiture. Um, but it's only 4% of the purchase price, this $10,000. And so it seems like kind of a small amount. In the Uzan case, they upheld 25%. Usually, I think anything under 10, they would probably uphold without any problem at all. Um, what she would have to prove? Well, she would have to prove that this is not a forfeiture, that this wasn't an estimate. Actually, the other side would have to, she, she's trying to prove this is a penalty. So she would have to prove that they meant it as a punishment. She would have to prove that um, this is not easy, difficult to calculate, and it's real estate, so it probably is, because it's hard to know precisely what the value is without a sale. And she would also have to prove that this is not a reasonable estimate of damages. These are really going to be hard to prove. Um, should it matter, this question too, should it matter if she breached willfully or not? Is it different if she just decides she doesn't want to buy or if she couldn't get her loan and so she just didn't have the money to die, buy? Um, as a matter of law, it should not matter, but as a matter of reality, often it will because sometimes a court will feel sorry for a buyer who couldn't get their financing and then they'll try to use the liquidated damages clause as a way to give them back their money by saying, oh, it's a penalty. But if it had been a willful breach, they probably wouldn't have done that. So that's the reality that's different than the law. Um, suppose the clause is enforceable and the home taxes are fallen so much that Ed's resale price of the home is only $200,000. Can he get any more? No. Because if it is enforceable, all he can get is $10,000. If he had no liquidated damage clause, he could try to argue he should get $50,000. But oh well, he, it's sort of a bet. You're betting it's going to be... 10,000 or less, and if it ends up being more, then you take that, uh, the loss. And if the market for homes increase and he resells for 260, will it still enforce the liquidated damage provision? Again, we have to look at the reality of the law. The law says it doesn't matter. If it's a valid provision, he can get $10,000 plus an extra $10,000 by resale. He bet and he won. You know, he was the other side of the bet. But again, the reality is if you have a case where there's no loss, and in fact, if there's a gain, then maybe a court will use the provisions of the penalty law as a way to, they'll say it is a penalty because there's so much squishiness in the law that they can try to say it's a penalty and strike it down. So you have this judicial policing, it's kind of an interesting situation. So just to recap, we have lots of reasons why parties agree in advance to set their damages. It's easier, it's more efficient, you avoid having to argue things are foreseeable, you avoid the problem of speculative, um, speculative profits, and you have a predetermined amount, so people who want to breach know exactly how much that breach will cost them. But the negative aspect, it's, it really is just a forecast. And it depends on how good of a guesser you are. If you make a really good guess, it should be right on target, but you could be shooting too high or shooting too low. And interestingly, the courts, although there's this provision in US law for freedom of contract, they sometimes do strike them down either because they are intended to be a penalty or because they actually ended up operating as too big of a breach. Um, courts have long followed the practice of refusing to enforce provision that says it's liquidating damages, but in reality is a penalty. It's a little bit controversial. There are two approaches, but it's true that all courts do draw this distinction between enforceable liquidated damages and unenforceable penalties. And the problem with that, let me just end on this, is it's it injects into contract provisions an element of uncertainty. And uncertainty is costly. You enter into a contract, you say, we're going to pay $10,000 of damages. But that 10000 comes with a little footnote that says, maybe, maybe, because a court might find that to be unreasonable penalty and take it out. And because of that, you always have a little bit of less certainty in your contracts than otherwise you would have. Um, I find it a really interesting area of the law, and I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Kenny has to say. And what's your place?
rubrikshe zalian didi madlova minda gadavkhedo Karlotan Andreas asetan saintereso moxsenebi satis tuntsa sanam chams moxsenebaze gadavido da randenime saki khema interesebs da ase vtkvat pirulrikshe gamoviqene tkven suplebas da Karlotan Andreas men titan dausme randenime shekitvas es pirulrikshe emsakhureba im mizans rom shedarebit samatlebri analiz kondes adgili shemdek ukvat chani moxsenebis dros Pirveli rats ma interesebs Karlotan Andreas kan aris is rom pirgasam tekhos gatvalis tinebi შემთხვევაში პირგასამტეხო ეს არის ჯარიმა ვალდებულების დარღვევისთვის თუ ეს არის რეალურად მინიმალური ზიანის ანაზღაურების ბერკები if the if the purpose is to be if the purpose is to be a penalty of what did you say restitution for the restitution is okay but if it's to penalize the breach if it's to give some sort of um, you know slap because you breached the men that will be struck down because that's not considered a valid recovery. Is that the question? At all, at all, in U.S., there is no penalty? There is U.S. law? No yes, penalty? you're not supposed to have a penalty. It's supposed to be compensatory only. So you only, you, then that's why the whole point is that you have to show that somehow this was your guess about what you could recover. It, you can't, it's not, it's invalid to say, I really don't want you to breach this contract, and so if you do, you have to give me some big amount. If you say that, it's going to be invalid right away. You know, if you, if you breach this, this contract, then I'm going to take your, you know, your daughter or something. I mean, <laughs> something so huge. But so if it's something that's clearly a penalty, even if they say, our damages are this much, but if you breach, we don't want you to breach, it really means a lot to us, then we'll strike it down. That's not going to, we're going to give a penalty because that's just considered an invalid reason to recover. And it's interesting because it kind of goes back to the fact that we want to enforce agreements, but we want to let you breach. And there's an economic way to let you breach, but what it's not is that keeping agreements are good and breaching them are bad. It's not a moral judgment. Because if it was, then you could have a sort of a, pen, you know, a punitive aspect. And there's just not a punitive aspect. It's interesting. ანალიზისთვის <laughs> No, <laughs> no, you can't. In fact, that's the, the it's the maximum recovery and it's the minimum recovery. And and they would. I know you're using. I don't know if it's the same word in Georgian, but in in Georgian, the the, the translation said penalty. But you, if, if I keep every time I hear the word penalty with the, a clause, I kind of go ooh because if you call it a penalty clause, they will not enforce it. They have to call it agreed damages, or stipulated damages, or liquidated damages. All of that's okay. But if it is a penalty damage, they won't enforce it. Now, it's also, so it's, if it's too high, they won't enforce it. But if it's too low, even if it's really, really too low, it doesn't matter. They give you the minimum if it's the balance clause. Madiloba, Echara Cheheba, Sarkatos, Kanada, Lobisha, Sabamisa, Zianis, and as Howard of his Tina Pirobes. Nuria Lurat from Vititrum, Zianis, and as Howard of his Tina Pirobes, Sarisakato, Samkako, Codexi, Samasat Mustamet of Metamokri, Anu Rodis as Ria Lurat Sahiziaris, Aval de Pulevis Darbara, Anu, Zian Shazleva, or Context Shigami, Zian Shazleva, it was as a Costelic Kidans Armoshobili, other Zian Shazleva, it was a Sahel Shakurabo, Samar Lebri, Utier Tobidans Armoshobili. The Sahel Shakurabo, Samar Lebri, Utier Tobidans Armoshobili. Zianis <laughs> <laughs> 
ქალაქში არის ავალდებულების დარღვევასთან და რომ ეს დარღვევა რეალურად განაპირობებს აი ამ ზიანის დადგომას. ეს არის ის აუცილებელი წინაპირობა ზიანის ანაზღაურებისათვის, რაც ჩვენ ყველა ძალიან კარგად ვიცით გათვალისწინებული არის საქართველოს კანონმდებლობით. ეხლა რა არის სახით ზიანი შეიძლება იყოს და რა არის სახით ზიანი შეიძლება მოვითხოვოთ, ანუ კიდევ ერთხელ ქალოტანი ანდრიას მისამართის მინდა დავას უსტო რა საუბარი არის არა დელიქტიდან წარმოშობილ ზიანზე, არამედ სახელშეკრულებო ზიანზე, ანუ ვალდებულებით სამართლებრივ კონტექსტში ზიანზე. ეხლა რეალურად ეს ზიანი ზიანი რა სახით შეიძლება იყოს? ზიანი ერთი მხრივ ჩვენ ძალიან კარგად ვიცით, რომ შეიძლება იყოს ფაქტობრივად დამდგარი ზიანი და მეორე მხრივ შეიძლება ეს იყოს მიუღებელი შეუმოსავალი. ფაქტობრივად დამდგარი ზიანი ეს არის ის ზიანი, რომელიც რომელიც ქონებრივი დანაკვისიც განიცადა რეალურად მხარე მაშინ როდესაც მეორე მხარე დაარღვია ვალდებულება, ხოლო რაც შეეხება მიუღებელ შემოსავალს, მიუღებელი შემოსავალი, ეს აუცილებლად უნდა იყოს ის შემოსავალი, რომელსაც იგი მიიღებდა ვალდებულება ჯერ რომ ადრე შესრულებული იყო. და ძალიან საინტერესო საკითხი, რომელიც ქალბატონ ანდრიამას ახსენა, რომ ზიანი უნდა იყოს პრეზუმირებული, რას ნიშნავს? მხარე როდესაც არ გვაქვს ვალდებულებას, მან სავარაუდოდ უნდა იცოდეს რა ზიანი სანაზღაურების ვალდებულება დაეკისრება. აქედან გამომდინარე ძალიან საინტერესო არის 14 მუხლი პრეზუმირებულ ზიანთან დაკავშირებით. ანუ თუნდაც მიუღებელი შემოსავლის კონტექსტში არ შეიძლება მხარეს დაეკისროს ზიანი, რომელიც მისთვის წინასწარ არ იყო სავარაუდო. ასევე ზიანის დაკისრების მხრივ ძალიან საინტერესო არის ბრალი საკითხი და 14 მუხლის სამოქალაქო კოდექსის, რომელიც შერეულ ბრალი თვალისწინებს და რომელიც ძალიან ასევე თქვა აქტიურად გამოიყენება ა ქართულ სასამართლო პრაქტიკაში და კიდევ ერთი საკითხი მორალურ ზიანთან დაკავშირებით. ნუ მორალურ ზიანთან დაკავშირებით არის აზრთა სხვადასხვაობა, ნუ პირველი აზრთა სხვადასხვაობა დაკავშირებული არის იმასთან რომ მორალური ზიანი შესაძლებელი არის მხოლოდ და მხოლოდ კანონით პირდაპირ გათვალისწინებულ შემთხვევებში და კანონით პირდაპირ გათვალისწინებული შემთხვევა ეს არის საქართველოს სამოქალაქო კოდექსის 1919 მუხლი რომელიც რომელიც საუბრობს ასე თქვა და ჯანმრთელობისათვის ზიანის მიყენებაზე მხოლოდ ამ კონტექსტში არის შესაძლებელი მორალური ზიანის მატერიალური ანაზღაურება მხოლო რაც შეეხება სხვა შემთხვევებს სხვა შემთხვევებში მორალური ზიანის ანაზღაურება შესაძლებელი არის კანონით ზუსტად გათვალისწინებულ შემთხვევებში ძალიან საინტერესოა საკითხი იმასთან აშირებით რეალურად პირის გარდაცვალების შემდეგ შესაძლებელი არის თუ არა მორალური ზიანის დანაზღაურება. ამაზე არის აზრთა სხვადასხვაობა, სხვადასხვა შორის ერთიანი დადგენილი პრაქტიკა არსებობს რომ არ არის ეს შესაძლებელი, თუმცა არსებობს პრაქტიკიდან გამონაკლისებიც, რომელიც ამბობს რომ რეალურად მორალური ზიანის დანაზღაურება შესაძლებელია პირის გარდაცვალების შემთხვევაში. ეხლა რაც შეეხება უშუალოდ გამარტივებული წარმოებით უნდა წარიმართოს ეს სამართალ წარმოება თუ რეალურად ჩვეულებრივი სასაშელო წარმოებით, ამაზე და უფრო გვიან გისაუბრებთ. ეხლა რაც შეეხება უშუალოდ პირდასამთავრობას. ესე იგი პირდასამთავრობა რეალურად რა არის ჩვენი კანონმდებლობის შესაბამისად? პირდასამთავრობ პირდაპირ და თავიდანვე უნდა შეთანხმდეთ, რომ ეს არ არის ასე ვთქვათ სანქცია ჯარიმა დარღვევისათვის. იმისათვის რომ სასამართლომ გამოიყენოს პირგასამტეხლო იმისათვის რომ ხარეს დაეკისროს პირგასამტეხლოს ანაზღაურება რა წინაპირობა უნდა არსებობდეს პირგასამტეხლოს დაკისრებისთვის პირველი ეს აუცილებელი წინაპირობა სახეზე უნდა იყოს ვალდებულების დარღვევა ნუ ჩვენ თავში ვერ ძალიან მნიშვნელოვანია და ეს არის მკიცედის საგანში შემავალი გარემოება რა არის საერთო თვითონ ვალდებულება ძალიან ხშირად ჩვენ როდესაც პირგასამტეხლოზე საუბრობთ ფულად ვალდებულების დარღვევასთან მიმართებით მოვიაზრებთ პირგასამტეხლოს არა რა თქმა უნდა პირგასამტეხლო პირს შეიძლება დაიკისროს ვალდებულების დარღვევისათვის რომელიც უშუალოდ არ მომდინარეობს ფულად ვალდებულების შესრულებიდან და ფულად ვალდებულების შესრულების დარღვევიდან რომ ეს არის პირგასამტეხლო, რომელიც ნებისმიერი ვალდებულებით სამართლებრივი მოვალეობის დარღვევიდან მომდინარეობს. აი მაგალითად, თუ ნარდობის ხელშეკრულებაა და მე დამიკვეთ ეს რეალურად ასეთყოლი ფეხსაცმლის დამზადება და თუ მე რეალურად გადავაცილე ვადას, ხელშეკრულების შესრულების ვადას ან კიდევ საერთო თარშევა სრულე ვალდებულება, მე შეიძლება დამეკისროს პირგასამტეხლო. ანუ ერთ პრინციპზე ცალსახად შევთანხმდეთ, რომ პირგასამტეხლო ეს არა არა ეს არ არის 
خودت هم خودت پولادی وارد کل بیست دارو بیست بیست آره سه بیست هست که دارو دارم وقتی سه خس میچوت میدم و خلیس هر وار اما وس آنو سکر تو دست همو کلا کودکسیس سه خس میسام مختن ریالوره ترومیلی سریس خلش کل بیست مکمل دو بیست پریو چی سرگه بری پولادی تان خیس میس خلو خلش کل بیست وادی سامو تصویر شندگ ریالوره دی سریس میوه بری شما سه ولی دارم استن دکافشی ره بیت مبینه بیت سه دو خرده دالوره بیس اوبرد کی دو ورتی زالیان سعی در است سعی خی ترم زالیان کارگر توی تو خلش کل بیست پرما در رد سر و در اپرتی اکثری را بولی قصد توی از خلش بول بیست کانون دکات فلسطین بول پرما سان خریت شکل خم دکات فلسطین بول پرما تو آرگ ما اپیلس ریالورات آرنای را در از آرمان شبا سمت لبریوی شده که بی در خم من می ده که از کنی کنی باید شکی خواه ما ما مرتوبی گیم ما کالیتی رم کاری می آورد کالبات آن اندریاس دچم شوریس دایدو ناردو بیست خلش بول با ریالورات می وار می ناردو می واره با رم هستی توی پرسات ملی است قطعاً عصیت کلی پرسات ملی مقام زدو از خلاصه کل بدای دو زبیری پر می‌دهد چون از آواه دیت سه مرتلو شیم سپت ولی دانگام دیناره رو می‌ری اول ورد آرشی و سرول چند زد از رقولی و آلت کل با سه مرتلو شیم می‌بادیس کالب می‌دا کالب آنی اندریا دا اولی منی وام بود تانو تا خود بیت ناردو بیس پیرو ببزه تا خود بیتی مزرعه عصیت کلی پرسات ملی اون داشته مگر تا خود بیتی مزرعه خی پرسات می‌س کوسلی اون دا قبیلی خو عیان دام مسالیت تا خود بیتی مزرعه و داشیم داشته مسرول بینه د پیرگسان تخت باوال دبولی بیست در مامیست بیست. کدات خدا ایت بولی با تایر تبلیو بید رم می دوار بیا خلاصه کوله با. دامه کی سر بات واره پیرگسان تخت ماشین را دست چون قبلا ابسط کرد و پیم دیگه اکس اکس تیره بولی آنو قبلا پاکت بولی کاری ما باری داده است بوره بولی سازمان تلاشی. میکروپانی تو شاید لب تو همیم دامه تخم با آنو از زلی زلی انسان درس مارت اوی مگر من زلی انسان درس ساکی درم لی زلی نکتوالوی از سامار تو پрактиکاشی سامار اون تو دارم دو دقیقه کیست رو تیمی داره پیدا کنم تا خلاصه شد تا خلاصه اون تو سودا خود سعی رو بودی پرما Ալբ ոտ համազ եմ շտարեպ սասամարդով մենաբլով դարույց պրակտիկար արիս մագրամը թուկ անոս մի ուպավիտ։ Չանաց լեպ ստուարը սախլ շեր ուրեպ ապորմած շետ անիլի սարջելի, դա սարջել զէ շետ անիլի շեսագեպելի, անում ریالورا پیرگسان تخلیه آشش تخم بولید. اون دادای کیس رو ماست پیرگسان تخم. دم با پس وقت سوام بود سرک ای نبودت راک نداد. وار بیه دم پیرگسان تخم تی اگر تو ازش نگویی. ما این دلیل است که سعی میکنیم باشی سعی میکنیم داشته سعی بکنیم که نبود تو الان آلترنات اولیورسیا از اتکات از این لوبی دیشه تخم بیست پیرگسان تخم استان داغ آشش. چه میاد؟ میخواد ودیمی سرکن. میگم دلوبی میخوادی. ای ساسام ارتوس اون آشن تو اشی اون دا بیه بیه تیس نسل تو ات ایم آم خرچ کوله بیس پیرو بیس تالاشی داد توی بیس اوبر بات در آتو ایمی تو برام ریال ولت خرچ کوله بیس تالاری میزنی خش تا بیش از پلی اوبر بیس پارک لیف شاری اسرم خاره ما کامو خاتون نیب خو تو خاره بی تاکت بیارم مات سرچه دی شیطانم دریتی توی تاتر یست نیب کامو خات است تا پیکسی دس ده آبشت خوشی ساوباری که کشیده که بیست سرچه لیست پارک لیفش ایرو بی تابیکسی ره بازه میوه توی رو سه سمت ولار و نچای دیوس خاله تا کامو خاتون نی بازه ده اون داره قابلی پیتی رو سیس تالاشی خوب نورم دانو بیکس ات خونه داره یکیش رو زالیان سعی داره سواد کنیم از سر بار. پرینسی بشه اگر گاوک تو گاوک تلوت اگر گاوک تلوتی که در گاوک دیناره شده با ایرتی دا دوست رو بات میکنیم. Միկրո կամշին թղաշ չէ իլեպը գամույի կանետ, սամուկարով ստապոցիս կանում դեղ ուրեմիս ասոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոսոս
خاره می دی سازمان مرتبشی دایت خوب ایر کسان داخل سات تازیان سات تا خود بیت سکانم دو بودن زیر رم ارتد چه سات لبیلی دم میاره چه سات لبیلی آن مینیمال است نیان تان ارتد میشه از لب آمومی خواب ناریالورات ایس خواب آن تو مو مرگمه آتی لاریس زیانی ایر کسان داخل ناریالورات دامی پارا وری لاریس زیانی میمیدی وار سازمان مرتبشی دایت خوب ایس لات تا آت لارس پر و لارس آن تو بیت خواب راوند دارم کیتان آن تو تورمیت اغلا تورمیتی زنی هم نیستی سوپایی. از اینکی پیروی را هم دارم کیت شد. پیرگسان تخلو، اسایس. پیرگسان تخلو درست است. کیت سه بیست سگانشی شما ولی کاری ماره باری را. دایروها تو را ولت بوله با. روگرتسکی سه سمت و داده استورپس. او پرستاره. خاره وی روگرتسکی داده استورپ. ده سه سمت و روتی سه سمت داده استورپ بول پاکت زیت خویس. رم کی نام دو ولت داروها ولا خلاصه کرده با. آیا سه چند خواشی او از وقت اینجا پیرو باری سه پیرگسان تخلو است کیس رفیس. مگر این شن پوشی تو مخاری تخص زیان ساز از چند پوشی و مخاری وارد بولیا رام آمپیتوس آمپیتوس ریال ورد پاکت ابریبات دامدگاری زیانی آنو پاکت ابریبات دامدگاری زیانی سود نبارم ولی زریت از دامد پدر سریس نوره بری شن مسافر ریال ورد پاکت ابریبات دامدگاری زیانی از تو بیو باشی اون دا آمپیتوس ابرادو تاکسی که خیلی گفتم مصرف کردم بیست و ده آمد که تصور کردم میورم خارج مات سات این آگم دکو کمیل بیت داد گاز یعنی دار سباز میشه زبری بیکابشی بیت آسیشان تک داسیشان تک آره رات کم آمد همیت اروپ ایرگاسم تخلص تاکیس را بیست روز رو دست موت مدت با والد بوله با دایر و توارا ریال ورد والد بوله بیست دار و بیست شم موت مدت بیست آبزه رات ایرگاسم تخلص داری تو خسیم سخوره با ماند موت مدت با بین دارم و یا خشک کوله با تا خشک کوله بیست پرالی و دارو باس کند تو آره ادغی دنیا ایدان از اینا پیرو به بیتو کامویی ریت خ رات کم اوده پیرگا سمت خوش تا کسر بات کامویی ریت خ با دا از رات کم اوده این تا بیتو کامویی ریت خ شو ولی بریزی این است کسر میس شیست لب لباس ای از پرالی میده دا کم لب لو آن ورود سات رات اوماریس او پرو مارتی بی پیرگا سمت خوش شد هم پیرگا سمت خوش شد هم بعد از سه مرحله پрактиکاشی زنی اخشی را داریم مگر ایت بی ماستن دا کاشی رو بیترم اما دار با کودکس که کسر باش Հիատասիլարի, հիալուրը դասիատասիլարի անիարիս ես կոնտրակտի։ Կանանի ամբովսրով իր գասամտախլը շեիցլպա իկոս իմազ է ու պրոմետի վիտրը հիալուրը դամտկարի զիանի է։ Թունցա արդակավից պետրում սասամարդլոսամս իր գասամտախլը շենցիրովիս վալդակուրեպա։ � Հանք դեպիտ շեմբեք սակիտղս է, ռոմ իր գասամ տեղլոց դա զիանից կանի խիլեպա չվովլեպրիվիս ասարջելոց արումովիս ծայսիտ։ Դա շիրատ աղրևասը հագուսխով մի ատգիլի, ռոտեսաց մխարեի թխոս կամարդի اما استان دلیلی که اون در ارتباط است که آنونیر دلشی شسولی کنن چنین خود آمیشم تو باشیاریس شست لبیلی رو موی تو کامان دیگه بولی زار مال با کانی خیلی چنین ساکن خود در ارتباط است و تاشی مامتن خود دم خود چیز رنگ است چیز رو بسوزد با کاموی خن پریودیسیارات کارم سیس خیس ما سیس کنن چنین تاریس دارم از قبل پیش شست لبیلی کامان دیگه بولی زار مال است ازید مگرم شست لبیلی هم خود دم خود دلیلی که اسپاری کرده تا آرام تا آرام تر تر چند خواهیم ساخت شکل با زیانیس پارگلیش. اخلا را چه خب؟ شندگ سعیت خس اسایس پیرگا سمت خس شنتی لب. پیرگا سمت خس شنتی لب ساکم و دکتر آوری سعیت خیا. ریال ورد از ارتدرتی دیسکریتیاریس سه سمت لوس شیران شیان سیروس بیگا سمت خلا توم تا دلیل سعی درست که سعی خیدم و قطعا تمام چیز لب افکار چه میاره رو بذش چه رو بذش یوریست مسافر سر بارم در مسافر مسافر مزه مسافر 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 مسافر
կանոնիկ իտապիլ արագովս կանպանիս ծինեպուլի շեղ ուսապամապիս գրիտարիում էբի սեվերոգոց սաջարոց ասրիկիս գրիտարիում էբի կամսածուրալի գրիտարիում էբի ամիտով մոչոն եմ խեմցխանելով ծասամարդով պրակտիկիտ։ Ես մարդալի արիս զոգատի չանած այդ ումսա զոգատում ունախաս ասետքատի իծլևա հասակ իտխեպս ունամի եկ ձեզ ուրանովա մաշի ռոտեսաց հասամարդու ավրես չէ սապամիսովա շեղ ուսապամովի սիսակից։ Ես ձալիան գուծրպելի ոյսից տունցա մեծ ձալիան կարգատվից ոտիրո ես խիտի ու կոյի ոգամող են է բոլի պրակտիկաշի, դա ձալիան շիրատ խելշեք ուրեպևշի մարդոյի միտորով իր կասամ տեղլով ծիլ դեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտեղտ
Akedan kanun dinare xaris uariet kuab irka samtakhwa samat xaure bazet. Es am kuari kazat kuat ireba kamo itana sakavatsia sa samat xaure. Sakavatsia sa samat xaure ima nazilshi romel nazilshi sakavatsia sa samat xaure kuaro ki darugwa ni qomadam es hari qo iseti darugwa anu iseti minishuna qomani darugwa kuat kiba samshena do biznesi tan kamo dinare kuat oriata samat xaure somu chen de kase chen de kromel chen ukle baz kuat xaure somu uari kuat xaure shakule baz tunza. ایسی مزار نیشن استم چه نارگا خرس کوله بدن گاز بی سوپل بدن آرت پیر کسان تخلص آن از خاوره بی سوپل بدن نیو خدمت این است چه نارگا بات آرمو دیشب استوار خرس کوله باز وایست کم سوپل باز چه نوپل با گاز مامی تخلص پیر کسان تخلص دم بر قطعی ولیستی آن کدات پدر لباس سب سولی دولت به تخم بدن آم تام سه سمت رو پرکی کاشی هر اسم را توضیح کرده ایش شده را دیتا آنالیز کرده که تیکی داوود خس می خوته مخلص رمیوری ناتیز به خود بودند. رمیلی زمان باز کرد خیلی شکل بازی واری تا اوضو بله یا تو تارگو و کامو تو اولیاریس کریدیت آریس برایت. آیا سه چند خواشی آریس تو آرشی سطح لپلی پیکا سمت خواست تا کسی بگه تو داد کی دارم ریال و رات تارگو و کامو رو به اولیاریس کریدیت آریس برایت. رات کنم اونا زیان سال از خواب و کامو ریز خولیا دشی سه بانو سه کامو ریز خولیا ری پیکا سمت خواست تا کسی بگه. آمید اون سال سه خدا زهره سرتیس کامو تا اوت خس میخواد مخلص رمیوری ناتیز تا می مرتب شاند خواشی، اون در دادگیری دست پیر کسان تخصص تاکیس رو بیستی نبی رو ببی، رازت شوند این تاوی تو پریزنتاسی سال خواب است روز نبی ساوبرد. تا ارثی سابولوس، ارثی ساکیت خیلی دامی تی باسوله، اسرائیل هر بیت راجع به تنها کافشی رو بید. رودیسات ساسامات لو آمپوس روم اسرائیل شو سبب مطمئن خالی پیر کسان تخلو، تا اس پیر کسان تخلو اون داشتن سیکس. کن از وقت میشنه که خیلی تام سوم تاسیت شدی خواست روم تو ساسامات رو تابی سیم سیاتی بیت بیرون سیل است پیر کسان تخلو، رات آم اتولیس روم اس پیر کسان تخلو آری سچرو تسری کسات میزینه آمد دکی. ریال رودیس ساسامات رو سانگواری میگم ما اسی ریال رودیس ساسامات رو پلیتیکا آن میگم اس ساسامات رو سی ای ماستن تا کافشی رو بیت روم اتیم خارج بیاری خارج سخت شکل لب و تیر تو باشی تا اون سه بیت بلات هست که تا هرگام تیر کنی و تون تا آن پوزیتی از آن بسته بیست سوس بیت زد بیلا بیکی به سخت شکل لب و تا ویس خرید بیت انگام دینا دامی هم بسته میان کار کت وقت نبرد او برادر تو اسرام شو سبب مت مخالی اپیر کسان تخلوهاری پیکرپ ترم از از عریس تا سخت سه جلو تسلیت سه میسات این آمپیکا او برادر سنو با خصوص بیت زد آب سر و دست کار کت ولس کار کت میل خسته نبود رسا و بیت راش کار کت وقتی لب بیت سنو با خصوص بیت خدا توی سی سال بالاتر از سال مرد لس میاد که توی سی سال بالاتر از سال مرد لس میاد سال بالاتر از سال مرد لس اول باره اکسون چای ریوس توی سال مرد لس میاد که میشه توی سال مرد لس آرکی درجه بیست آرکی درجه بیست پیش ما از ایرتا درتی اول باره اکس کانو میتونیم چه بولی رو توی سی اول با مسیل بیتان کامو دیناره کدات قطعی را سه سال توی سپوکتی چه توالت سه جلو تسلیت کی سه میسه توی نام سگات آمید آمار هدگان بری ری با خرس شکل باشی تا بینه دام ما زم خود دزدی بر کتی داشتنیه زیری تان خیلی خو اتاسیلاری سرگ بری خو ساماسیلاری تا پیرگا سمت خلود خو سامی اتاسیلاری از آنیش شو سبب مدت مقالی پیرگا سمت خلود تا میچن سجرات اسری دیسات میساتی نام بگات اسی او زیری تادیم نادری چه میمکسنه بیزارگاو که این مه چه مس پریزنتاسیاس مطلب از کی خود اورات را بیسا 